kind of a flat I thought. It's, I guess it's going to be hard to clear. I've not gotten any. Oh well, yeah, you were live. So it, it's not working no more. It says you're live right now. Are you live right now on something? Yeah, we're live. I'm not going to come to a uh, cream in my coffee. Will you do it? Yeah, you only got one. <laughs> There you go, Mr. McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see on the show thread. Hey, Jamie. Hey, Nelly. Hopefully, we got a hot show thread today. That's what we've been missing. That'd be nice. All right. Thank you so much. There you go, Mr. McMahon. <laughs> cup of cold coffee that's meant to be hot. Hmm. No, Brittany, I'm not going to be able to make it to Kelly's wedding, unfortunately. I wanted to, but unforeseen circumstances came up and is going to keep me from going. But I wish him and his lady well. But I'm going to make it up to him. I'm going to go out to Vegas and we're going to have some fun. Kelly was, every time I go to Vegas, mm -hmm. Kelly is the guy who I just hang out with when I'm out there. Like, he showed me the Vegas ropes. Yeah. He's getting married this weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, tomorrow? Mm. This Well, Saturday. Saturday. So, so, sometime this weekend. Well, congratulations. Yep. All right, how's your headphones? Go about 30 seconds. Sunday is his wedding. Huh? Sunday is his wedding. Sunday. The views expressed on this program are not necessarily hey, the of Lexington Community Radio or its board of directors. The views expressed are solely those of the programmers. I'm ready for uh, graduation on Saturday or Friday.
Welcome everybody to Off the Cuff. I am Adam Banks coming at you live from Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you for listening to the show and thank you for tuning in to WLXU 93.9 FM. In addition to listening to us on the radio, you can check out our Facebook live stream at Off the Cuff with Adam Banks or you can download the Radio Lex app on your smartphone device to listen to us anywhere in the entire world. Amber Turner and I are both broadcasting from the Deborah Hensley Studios here at Radio Lex on North Limestone. Amber, we are coming out of Memorial Day weekend. It is Thursday, June the 3rd. Memorial Day weekend, did you go and visit anybody's grave this Memorial Day weekend? No, I did not. Okay, well that's a good thing. I mean, I guess that means that you didn't have people that has passed away that you feel like is worthy enough to go visit, right? Now look, Frank, you know I do. I thought you was going to ask me if I barbecued or something. You know I don't do graves and I don't do funerals. Hey, I, and I don't do none of that. I didn't really know how to start off that. I, once I started, I didn't really know where I was going with it. I was like, what? But I don't know about you, but I don't, because everybody's Facebook timeline is different. Yeah. Mine was full of pictures of graves. Pictures yeah, of graves. absolutely. Graveyards, graves. And I don't know why that's so necessary. Why is it so necessary to take a picture of a person's grave and post it on social media? Why? I think that people are just trying to show uh, that they have went and they have taken care of their loved one's headstone and they have presented it properly, I guess, as a homage to that person's memory. Yes. Well, graveyards is, is a whole mood in general. Yeah. <laughs> graveyards are... If, I remember, I remember when I was four-wheeling back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, one of the trails that I used to go on as a kid, I was a teenager, and I used to four-wheel ride a lot back home, and I remember I could stumble upon a graveyard if I took this certain trail, yeah. and this graveyard was so cool because mm -hmm. it was tombstones that were, that were back from the 1800s. Oh, yeah. But did you know, Amber, though, that that's very creepy to me, that... I found tombstones that were back from that long ago because did you know that back in the 1800s it was a actual very good chance that you could have been buried alive back in the 1800s. Yes. Yes, before the age of modern medicine, the fear of being buried alive was not an irrational fear. Absolutely not. Because there have been several cases throughout time where there have been reports of people being buried alive. So I went down this rabbit hole the other night. Oh, my word. Of looking up people who have been buried alive, stories of people who have been buried alive. That would be a horrible <laughs> thing, first of all, right? To be what buried the alive. time in the morning were you looking this up? This was actually not that late. <laughs> this was actually not that late. But that would be terrible to be buried alive. Absolutely. It? The thought of being in that just being underground, being that enclosed, being able not to move. spaces. Ooh. I don't like tight spaces. Just the thought of that. But it says here that uh, there, throughout history, there have been numerous cases of people that have been buried alive by accident. In 1905, the English reformer William Tebb collected, collected amounts of premature burial. He found 219 cases of near live burials, uh, 149 actual live burials, 10 cases of live dissections and two cases of awakening while being embalmed. There have been many urban legends of people being accidentally buried alive. Legends include elements such as someone entering into the state of sulfur or coma. So back in the 1800s, there was times where people would fall into comas and uh, before modern medicine, people would pronounce you dead just off if, you're, if your heart wasn't beating, you're dead. Well, we didn't have the technology that we have now. We know that we've got uh, machines that can detect low heart rates. You know, back in the day, they had to go by so-and-so filling around for one. Yes, and there have been legends, too, that have been found that uh, tells that coffins have been opened up years later to find corpses with long beards or corpses with hands raised and palms turned upwards. Wow. Meaning they've been trying to get out. Yeah. Trying, you know, you've heard stories of people, their fingertips are, uh, the skin is off of, their fingertips because they've been trying to claw well, you can their see the way claw marks, out yeah. of the casket. That's scary. There have been actual reports of that in people's caskets. Well, I mean, you know why they call it night shift, don't you? When you're working the night shift. Yes, because back in the day, uh, there were people that were hired to just be in a graveyard to listen for bells. Yes. Because there were graves that people... That, that was such a big fear back in the day for people. Uh, as it should have been, as obviously. It should, as it should have been, because... 
uh, there were times where if you fell into a coma, people just thought you were dead, so they'd bury you. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't no embalming or anything like that back in the day. They would just throw you under the ground. And sometimes you'd wake up, you really wouldn't be dead. Mm -hmm. So that fear existed in so many people back in the day. They had special graves made for them so they could exit just in case that they were buried alive. They would have, um, let's see here, I've got here what it says. It says they would construct safety coffins to ensure that being buried alive could be avoided. They would have things like glass lids for observations, ropes to bells for signaling, and breathing pipes for survival until rescued. It says that the English phrases saved by the bell and or dead ringer are in some way related to such safety bells. So it's because of that is why we have graveyard shift. Yes. Yes. I love that you know that. Yeah, but people would actually, they were so scared of being buried alive, they actually installed bells in the casket. Well, yeah, because uh, I would say being buried alive might be, uh, although an irrational fear, especially living in 2021, I think it's probably quite possibly one of the worst. Oh my gosh, I feel like my chest is getting tight thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. But did you know that George Washington had a fear of being buried alive? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is why that. And he had such a fear of it, yeah. he demanded his body to be laid out for three days. Well. Yes, to ensure that just in case he didn't wake up. Well, Bob, he was in like a five-day coma. <laughs> right. He's in trouble. <laughs> Some people were so afraid of it, they would just demand once they died, quote-unquote, that their head would be chopped off mm. to ensure their death. Yeah. Because that was such a big fear. Uh, there are some graveyards that you can go to from the 1800s, mm -hmm. like 1800s, early 1900s graves, and you can see these safety graves, these constructed safety graves that they would build. Oh, yeah, themselves. you can still see the little bell holders. You can right? see the bell holders, the vents. that Sometimes they would install vents so they could breathe. I, I find it hilarious, though, that you actually would go to the graveyard. Like, you would find trails to head towards the graveyards when we were growing up. And I was the complete opposite. I was always finding the trails like, that is going to take me to the scary. Because I think growing up in eastern Kentucky, if you do not have a graveyard behind your house, I don't even think you really grew up in eastern Kentucky. Right. Yeah. But the thought, though, of being a graveyard uh, shift guy who listened for the bells, imagine that moment when you do hear a bell. Well, I can just imagine, you know, Ray Stevens come out with that song, Sitting Up with the Dead. Do you remember that back uh, in the 90s? Yeah. I could just imagine it being very much like that, you know. Mm -hmm. I ain't sitting up with the dead no more, especially but, when you hear a bell ring. But the fear of being buried alive, it is actually called taphophobia. Okay. And that's the fear of being buried alive. There are several different phobias, Amber, and mm -hmm. being buried alive is, is one of them, but there are several different phobias. Do you have any big fears yourself? I knew you were going to ask me this. So, what is the... You're looking up the actual name. I am. Right? I'm looking it up right now. Well... Um, <laughs> so, I do. I actually have two phobias. Uh, one has been with me since childhood, and one is now a new onset phobia. Uh, most people know I am suffering from agoraphobia. This is my one trip out of the house a week is to make my way over here to the station. What, what, what's agoraphobia? Agoraphobia is the fear or irrational fear of open spaces, oh. uh, which is so weird because I'm very claustrophobic as well. So I, I kind of have this internal battle. I uh, don't want to be in real tight spaces, but I don't be in real big ones either. Like the Dixie Chicks. <laughs> I mean, wide open, open spaces. spaces. And then, uh, you know, I do have chlorophobia. Which is? The fear of clowns. Okay. I do. I have yeah. an irrational fear of clowns. But you watched it, so it can't be that big of a fear. Well, now, look, you know, you've never sit down and watched, like, clown movies with me. We've never watched a clown movie right. together. Right. Um, anybody who has can tell you. didn't you. watch Bozo? <laughs> I did watch Bozo a little so, bit. So you can't be too terrified of clowns. Look, you watch Bozo. I he literally ran up on one one time over here at Jacobson Park, you know, I went to one of them fun house things, yes. and the dude was just doing his own thing, and I might have tinkled on myself, and that's when I realized I might be afraid of clowns. Well, there are a lot of phobias, a lot of phobias. Do you remember when Maury Polvich would do his specials on weird phobias that people would have? I mean, people would be scared of cotton balls, pickles, pickles balloons, cheese. olives. <laughs> I don't blame them sometimes on but, that. But what it was... It was very entertaining for us to watch because we would watch people freak out over these simple things. Mm -hmm. But Maury 
you talk about really exposing people's innermost <laughs> deepest fears. I remember he would he would tell this woman who was terrified of olives. He would say, "Calm down. There are no olives here. There are no <laughs> there are no olives here." And then she'd say, "Okay, thanks, Maury." And, and then he'd, he'd, and, and like, he'd go he'd throw them. and he'd say. Bring out the olives! <laughs> and then hear that they would bring out the olives. But there are a ton of different phobias, Amber, and I had compiled a list of unique, odd phobias. Okay. Phobias that you might have never even heard of. So I think what's going to be fun about this list is me to tell you the phobia name first, and let me see if you can guess it. Okay. Okay. The first one here is nomophobia. Fear of numbers? It's the fear of being without your mobile phone. Oh. Yes. So, th- this comes from cell phone addiction, obviously. Okay. A lot of people, they, they can't be without their phone for longer than, you know, 10 minutes. Yeah. 15 minutes. If they think they've lost it, they think they've lost everything. That's yeah. nomophobia. Nomophobia. Okay, here we go. Arithmophobia. Fair math. Exactly. Okay, there we go. Did the arithmetic give you a... It did. Okay, that is, that's the fear of numbers, actually. Okay. The fear of numbers. It's, you know, people grow up dreading math class like me. Oh, well, no and, wonder. And there's a lot of people that just genuinely don't like numbers. It makes it too complicated for them situation, so they just don't like it. Well. Uh, plutophobia. Plutophobia? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to ask that fear of pollution. That is the fear of money. Oh. The fear Who of Who has money. that? It says people with this fear may potentially sabotage their own careers to uh-huh. prevent them from making more money or becoming wealthy. This fear of becoming wealthy may stem from a fear of the responsibilities or pressures associated with it or the fear of getting robbed. I think I'd take my chances. <laughs> I think I would too. I'd, all that money buy me my security system. Okay, here's another one. Xanthophobia. Xanthophobia. Is the fear of the color yellow. <laughs> yes, uh, that would be terrible to be afraid of yellow. Now, if this were Maury, you'd just pull down like a little like <laughs> curtain and all the walls would be yellow. Maury would, like. would have some fun with <laughs> yeah. that one. All the walls would be yellow. He would yellow. say, look at this room. It's white. It's white. And then he'd say, bring out those yellow paint. And yeah. he'd splash it all over the walls. Oh, jeez. Okay, a blue. Okay, here's a good one. A blue two-phobia. A, a blue-to-phobia? A blue-to-phobia. I ain't got a clue. The fear of bathing. Oh, I know a bunch of people must have that. Yes. <laughs> Octophobia. Fear of October or the fear of eight? The fear of the number eight. Okay. Yes. What, which is weird because eight is my favorite number. Well. Yes, 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 yes. So it says, interestingly, there are a few other known phobias to specific numbers except for the fear of numbers themselves. And it says mostly 13 is that one yeah. that mostly people are afraid of. But it says people with octophobia not only fear the symbol 8 as it appears written down or addresses or in advertisements, but they also can fear objects present in groups of 8. Hmm. Yeah, it's just a weird psychological it's just a weird psychological thing. But uh, yet me being afraid of clowns was irrational earlier. Let's see, there's octophobia, the fear of opening one's eyes. There's globophobia, the fear of balloons. Well. Yes. Huh. Like the fear of them pop them or just like floating around? Floating around, seeing them. Well. I guess maybe the potential of them popping. Uh-huh. Okay, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Hippotomosostrosequiptalophophobia is the fear of long words. How much of that did you make up? I made most of it. <laughs> Okay, aphibophobia is the fear of adolescence. Oh. People who are literally afraid of kids, not midgets. Now, I mean, now, don't get me wrong, I kind of fear that. Not little people, I shouldn't have said midgets, but little people. Uh, yes. Mid- is midgets a thing? Do people still say midgets? <laughs> I, have, I have no clue. Okay, uh, there is omphophobia, which mm-hmm. is the fear of belly buttons. Yes. Like belly buttons? Yes. Like we all have one? You know, I think I might have that a little bit. I don't like seeing people's belly buttons that much, especially when... I don't what like do Audi. What do they call that, an Audi? An yeah. I don't like Audi. I don't like Audi. I like the car Audi. I don't... <laughs> Not <laughs> but, an Audi but, but, belly button. But when your belly button sticks out, I don't like that. I would rather your belly button just to, to go <laughs> well, in. Well, won't you put, their finger, put your finger in there and poke it back in? What causes an Audi? Um, I think it's hereditary. I think people who have um, hernias, like umbilical hernias, yeah. can have that happen. I'm sure maybe somebody on the thread can help me out right now. Let's see. There's more here. Lino-ophobia is a fear of string. There is Wait, string? String. So like lineophobia? Yes. Like you afraid of lines? Like strings. There is palgonophobia, which mm-hmm. is the fear of beards. 
you don't like beards. It says this usually stems from an alarming incident with a bearded person. It could also arise from a person not liking that a beard hides someone's face. Okay. Yeah. It says that people that have this uh, fear will avoid people with beards and may have anxiety when looking at a picture with someone with a beard. Well. There is ketophobia, which is the fear of hair. Okay. Yeah. I don't like loose hair, like hair in your food, and and I don't, I hate going and seeing just little tiny hairs on people's sinks and stuff because I Why don't know. Why are you judging me right now? I don't know where that came from. But From my head, buddy. From my head. Okay. There is vestophobia, which is the fear of clothing. Uh-huh. Maybe I have that, too. <laughs> there is ergophobia, which is the fear of work. Might have that one as well. There is decidophobia, which is the fear of making decisions. Well, why are you diagnosing me live on the air right now? <laughs> there are I saw trophobia, which you don't have, ladies and gentlemen. Amber doesn't, because that's the fear of mirrors. Because <laughs> when I walked into her house today before the show, I said, "What are you doing, looking at myself?" I said, "Why?" Because that's what I do. But the thing is, and, I, and I'm not picking on you, I'm not. He absolutely is but, right now. But people should never just look at themselves in the mirror because you're going to find something wrong with you. What you're going to find them. think I'm training my body to be an athlete. I'm looking for areas of improvement. I've been working on my biceps, my triceps. No, folks. <laughs> she'll look at her face for 20 minutes, like looking at different, like, she's like, oh, I didn't have this mode yesterday. Where did, <laughs> no, like, I don't do that. Okay, there is deepnophobia, which is the fear of dining with others, eating out with others. Oh. Yes. People, mm. Some people just don't like to go eat, eat out with others. But Now, we need to know what the phobia is for when people scratch their silverware on the plate. Because, oh, boys, that, that gets banks every time, y'all. But there are a, a ton of phobias. A ton of phobias. Ashley on the show thread says, the fear of clowns is not an irrational fear. It's 100% rational. I just... Really? What's so scary about clowns? Well, what's so weird is, you know, I grew up to marry somebody that has, like, red hair. What do clowns typically have? Red hair. Red hair. <laughs> you calling Wiley a clown? Speaking of, happy belated birthday. Yes, Wiley. Yesterday. Yes. Old thir- man. 39. 30, well, I wasn't going to say he's age. Enjoy that last year of the 30 club. <laughs> but, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after these words. Stick with us. Snakes. What's it called? Providing hope, housing, and health care. I have that one. The fear of snakes, ophophobia. Ophidophia. Hey, Lexington. Why won't you get the safe, effective COVID 19 vaccine? Uh, I'll do it for my neighbor. I've been waiting for it. Post about getting in on my other stuff. You want to do, do it here? Yeah, because I was going to make me a clip of it. Yeah, yeah how about after some of the week? Let's do this. I was just when making sure I didn't get no email telling me that I it had in fact not been. We'll do it after some of the week, okay? <laughs> yeah, that would. <works. laughs> I would double check. Well, the doctor now ain't going to work, so here we go. everybody to Off the Cuff. Adam Banks here with you. Amber is also in studio with me. We talked about the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air reunion that they had on HBO Max, which I enjoyed. Yeah. But HBO Max did another reunion. They released the Friends reunion. Mm -hmm. It crashed HBO Max, by the way. I know. A lot of people tuned in for it. I just don't understand... You know, I get it. Friends was a good show. It was. It was a good show for its time in the 90s. But 
People are obsessed with this show, friends. People I know. Will, literally, they will buy coffee cups, duffel bags, backpacks. <laughs> it don't lunch pails. It don't matter. They'll buy it. I it, know. It's a franchise. It is, absolutely. It's a brand. Uh, 100%. Think about how much merchandising is still sold today in 2021. And that show's not been on the air since 2004. Well, I think all of it might have ended up at Five Below, though, because Five Below's got a <laughs> lot of it. So, I don't know what that says. Well, I watched the Friends reunion, and the reason I watched it is because I I did watch Friends not really that much. I haven't seen every single episode. Did you ever watch Friends? I wasn't a fan. Even as a kid, I wasn't a fan. Okay. Yeah. Well, I watched it, so spoiler alert for anyone who plans to watch it, because I'm going to give you my review of what I thought of it. I thought it was interesting, because Friends, it was such a pop culture phenomenon, and it still, ex it still is relevant today. People still love it. Uh, I Some takeaways that I had from Friends, from the Friends reunion is Jennifer Aniston and David Schwimmer. You know, they had that little Ross and Rachel relationship. Oh, yeah. It was the big relationship. Did you know that they both literally had crushes on each other but never did date in real life? I found that out. Uh, you know, doing my own research, I figured we'd talk about it and I was like, mm, this ain't a good subject for me. Uh, so I did a little research and I've seen that and I was like, man, yeah, that's inter that's interesting to see. Yeah, I wonder if he looks back on that and thinks I should have pursued her harder because she is Jennifer Aniston. Well, I mean, but at the same time, you got to think. Look, they've been friends all these years. The reunion revealed that Rachel Green, the character that Jennifer Aniston played, was the hardest character to cast uh, because. Her character was supposed to be an unlikable character. It was supposed to be somebody you liked, but she did all kinds of unlikable characteristics. Yeah. The character did. She was spoiled. She was self-entitled. So they really needed to find an endearing character, and Jennifer Aniston just worked out. And it's funny how casting is everything for a show. Absolutely. If one person is wrong for the cast, it could mess up the whole dynamic. Mm-hmm. Think about all the shows we love. It's because the cast was perfect. Save by the Bell, the cast was perfect. One person different than the cast they had, it could really mess it up. Fresh Prince, it was perfect. Breaking Bad, it was perfect. You know, all these sitcoms and, and shows that just people still talk about today, it's because the casting was perfect. Exactly. Um, some of Hollywood's biggest stars pay tribute on the show. Lady Gaga came and sang Smelly Cat, Smelly Cat. I did watch that. Uh, Justin Bieber unfortunately showed up. <laughs> when, was he even alive when Friends was out? No. No, no, no. And I thought they would get more people who actually appeared as special guests on the show because Friends had a lot of people throughout the years. Absolutely, they did. Guest star, Brad Pitt. Reese Witherspoon. Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts was on there. I forgot that. Um, let's see, who else did we have? Uh, having a name blank. Uh, but a ton of people. It was just such a uh, pop culture phenomenon. It really was. You hit it out of the park with Brad Pitt straight out the door. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That's not where he met Jennifer, though. Absolutely not. I think they were maybe already together or working towards. Right. But the Friends Reunion, it is now streaming on HBO Max if you want to check that out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take Off the Cuff's Song of the Week break with a little levitating by Dua Lipa. We'll be right back after the song. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
the listeners know and I've been keeping the listeners updated and so is Amber with her journey into wrestling school a couple months ago she applied to the Al Snow Wrestling Academy Mm -hmm. and when was that you applied oh my gosh it feels like so long ago because I feel like I've been training so hard for it Uh, but I think it was what February because I had to wait until I got my wrestling license so it's been Pins and needles since like February, March. And we've been keeping people updated on that. Uh, She applied a couple months ago, and today Amber has some news to share with everyone. So, I am happy to announce that yesterday I officially received my acceptance into the Al Snow Wrestling Academy and School of Sports Entertainment. Yeah, so when's it start? Yeah. When's it start? Uh, September 13th is what they've tentatively sent to us. Um, I feel so weird even saying this because I never thought that this is where this journey would take me. Yeah. Uh, but folks, we're going to wrestling school. Yes. Not only are we going to wrestling school, but I'm going to wrestling school with Al Snow. Yes, you're going to Al Snow's wrestling school. I think that's awesome. You start in September. It's a year program. Yes. It's a great it's a great skill to have. I mean, what personal trainer has that on their resume? <laughs> what what woman can say, not only did I lose, what, 250 pounds naturally, um, I trained to become a professional wrestler all exactly. at the same time. Exactly. And that is going to be like a full-time job going to wrestling school. Uh, it's, it's like you won't even be unemployed anymore. <laughs> and speaking of unemployment, Amber, unemployment, a lot of people have been on it because of, of COVID. Yeah. And there's been tons of benefits with this new unemployment that uh, people have been given over the last year. What, $600 a week at one point. Yeah. And I think they shaved that down to $300 to three. a three. Well, that hasn't stopped the crooks from defrauding the government and stealing people's information and filing for unemployment under people's names. Mm-hmm. There was a doctor here in Kentucky that was a victim of unemployment fraud. So he got a notification that he had been unemployed for about six or seven months and his unemployment was about to run out. He was like, hold up. Yeah. I am not unemployed. I'm fully employed. I don't know what you're talking about. His name was Dr. Aaron Hesselson and he was a Kentucky doctor. And uh, he was made aware of this and come to find out that People have been stealing other people's information and using it to get unemployment benefits. If you're listening and you are someone who has done this, you're going to get caught. You're going to get caught. They're going to investigate this. So many people you hear uh, doing this, I would be scared to death to go and give up my freedom for six months of $600 extra a week, which is a lot of money, I might add, but I'd still be scared. Not worth your freedom. Not worth your freedom. No. And people wonder why I'm so apprehensive to give out any of my information, guys. I don't I do not do my social security number on the phone to anybody. It's crazy. Please stop filling out these surveys and stuff. Uh, and I'm talking to you, just in case you do this, Mr. Adam. Uh, 
don't be giving your personal information out. I don't care if it's even your favorite color because, you know, sometimes we use security questions like that. Very true. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after these words. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Lily Rochelle, and this is Radio Lex. Sorry, I had to say that. Huh. I had to say that. Sorry. No, you're good. Are you being threatened with eviction because of COVID-19? Is your landlord being uncooperative with filing for relief funds? The Lexington Human Rights Commission can help. We investigate discrimination claims, and there is no fee for our services. If you have a discrimination complaint, you can file it online at lexhumanrights.org or call us at 252-4931. appreciates the support of the Lex Tropics, the digital magazine covering Lexington's urban beat, featuring local writers, community models, and minority businesses each month, serving Lexington and surrounding communities for five years. To learn more, you can visit www.thelextropolis.com. For the people, by the people. fueled by more than 160 volunteers who produce more than 70 programs every week in English on WLXU 93.9 FM and in Spanish on WLXL 95.7 FM. <coughs> Today we're asking you to give what you can and every dollar counts. Your gift to the community is an investment in honest-to-goodness independent radio, a commodity that's become pretty rare these Who's days. Visit Hello. Hello. Hey, Kathy. Hello, Kathy. <coughs> Kathy right released another book. That's awesome. Welcome back, everybody, to Off the Cuff. Adam Banks here with you. Amber is also in studio with me. The ominous music of mankind. We met Mick Foley. We did. Nicest human being I have ever come encounter with. Yes, he's just a good person. He radiates good energy. He was the latest to be profiled on A&E. You know, A&E's been doing all these wrestling documentaries. Great, by the way. And I watched the Mick Foley one. The best one yet. I agree. The I actually... and. I it's surprising you said that, because I know you liked the uh, Stone Cold one pretty good. Yes. I love the Stone Cold one. I love the Macho Man one, HBK. But this one, this one is great, because it just shows how much, and it puts in perspective how much of a sacrifice Mick, Bowley, Mick Foley put his body through. So the documentary he grew up in, it shows that he grew up in Long Island, New York. We know about that, which he grew up knowing Kevin James, the actor from King of Queens. Okay, so I was wondering if that was the real, because I seen that they popped up Kevin James, and I was like, wait, is, is, is that him? Right. How weird would it be for you and your buddy to both grow up and be famous in two different industries? In two totally different industries. And be really, really famous. Exactly. Because both of them are really, really famous people. Yeah. But that's funny. But it talks about how Vince McMahon didn't want to hire McFoley because he was just somebody that that Vince McMahon looked at and says, you're just a hardcore guy. You just like to throw your body around. You're not really talented. But he, mm -hmm. finally, but he finally took a chance on him and hired him, and he became one of the best wrestlers uh, just in existence today. He's definitely one of my personal favorites, probably top three. Absolutely. Uh, he played three different characters, McFoley <laughs> did. He played... Dude Love, yep. Cactus Jack, uh -huh. and Mankind. Arguably the fourth would be... Would be his own self. Mick his Foley. own self. He even played his own self. Think about how hard that is. He made people fall in love with three different characters. <laughs> What's that meme? I love sending that to you every now and again. It's like when I meet people, I tell them I explain how Mick Foley entered the 1998 Royal Rumble three different times. <laughs> and then they leave and then I meet someone new and then... But it talked about Mick Foley being mankind in his infamous match with The Undertaker, The Hell in the Cell. I think that's what most people 
think of when they think mankind, when they think Mick Foley. If you don't know who we're talking about and you don't know what I'm talking about, go to YouTube and type in 1998 King of the Ring Hell in the Cell match between Mankind and Undertaker. I won't be disappointed. You won't be. Just type in Mankind versus Undertaker Hell in the Cell mm -hmm. and just watch that match. It's the greatest match of all time. It's, I don't know about greatest of all time. It's the greatest, inter, most entertaining match. It's my personal favorite. Dude, I was gonna say your personal. Yeah, this is this is from just my opinion, and it's the most entertaining match uh, to be out there. And that's coming from a huge wrestling fan, folks. But it talked about a lot of interesting things from that Hell in the Cell. Uh, it talked about how, well, if you watch the Hell in the Cell, you know that they started the match on top of the cell. <laughs> yes, and mankind. And Taker was going into this match. Ta Mankind really wasn't comfortable going to do this match because he really didn't feel like he was going to mesh well with The Undertaker. Mm -hmm. Their wrestling styles were different. And Shawn Michaels and Undertaker did the first ever Hell in the Cell, and it was so good. And Mankind's like, I'm not going to be able to top that. Yeah. So he came up with the idea of starting the match on top of the cage and The Undertaker throwing him off. Wow. So he throws him off the cage. To start off the match. Oh, yeah. And almost kills him. He dislocates his shoulder. You think he's dead. And you really think the match is over. So they put him on a stretcher and they're wheeling him out. Mankind gets up. Climbs <laughs> back up the cage with a dislocated shoulder. So Undertaker goes up after him. He's so exhausted. He uh, Undertaker goes for a choke slam And he choke slams him through the cage. And he mm -hmm. lands on in the ring. Oh, and there's a chair. And then there's a chair that comes down with him and oh. knocks his tooth out, which knocks his tooth up in his nose. Yes, and that infamous shot of him over in the corner just smiling. And then and then Mankind gets thumbtacks and throws th thumbtacks all over the <laughs> ring and ends up getting plowed into them by the Undertaker like a pincushion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mick Foley doesn't remember the match. The only reason he remembers uh, the match is because of going back and watching it. Yeah, he which has to be hard for him. Yes. He had a one stretcher per night limit. <laughs> so, he, he, he real, this is a true story. When he got put, when he got thrown off the cage the first time he was put on a stretcher and he asked the referee, Mike Kyoto, he said, have I been on a stretcher yet when they put him on the stretcher the second time? And yeah. Mike Kyoto's like, yeah, Mick. He's like, well, I can't be on a stretcher twice in one night. <laughs> so, and the match wasn't even uh, supposed to happen. It, it was scheduled couple of weeks before the pay-per-view. It was just kind of a throwaway match, and it yeah. become one of the most iconic matches of all time. I mean, you know my favorite's always going to be the 2000 Royal Rumble. Yes. So many different matches that Mankind has done, McFoley has done, and it profiles all of that in the documentary. Uh, between the three characters, Cactus mm -hmm. Jack, Dude Love, Mankind, which one was your favorite? Cactus Jack all the way. See, mine was Mankind. I, I get that. Don't get me wrong. I completely get that. I think my love of Cactus Jack is because my dad loved Cactus Jack so much. Mr. Socko and <laughs> all that. I got one word for you. <laughs> Socko! <laughs> and then he had a nice day. Like the sock was saying it. I loved it. Yes. It the best. Yes, it was good stuff. And now, what was it when he he said, I have 13 words for you. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Oh, my gosh, he would say that. And Vince McMahon just telling that. He's like, what are you talking about, me? <laughs> but it also profiled in the documentary. It showed, it showed mankind getting all of those terrible head chair shots by The Rock mm. at the 1999 Royal Rumble. Put in your Google machine or YouTube, <laughs> folks. It put in Rock versus Mankind, 1999 Royal Rumble. The what Rock was the documentary too, though. It was called Beyond the Mat. Okay, okay. And there was a documentary called Beyond the Mat. If you wanted to watch that, just instead of the match, because in the documentary it has the match and it shows kind of behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Mick Foley's wife and kids was in the audience during that match. In front the, row. Front what row. And The Rock was supposed to only hit Mankind five times with the chair. Which, if that's not enough. That seems like a crazy... But he goes off script and ends up hitting him like 12 times with the chair. Mm. And to know what we know about head injuries, it that's haunting. Absolutely. And to know that his kids were sitting right there in oh. the front row. I mean, we know they grew up to be great. You know, his daughter puts so much love out into the world, so great kids he has but man I cannot imagine like watching my dad get his head bashed down by the rock but it was a good documentary and Mick Foley was definitely one of my all time favorites we have an off the cuff 
uh, picture signed by Mick Foley. We do. It's our first official off the cuff. Yes. So now he's got to come and give us an interview. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after these words. Stick with us. There's more than 70 programs every week in English on WLXU 93.9 FM and in Spanish on WLXL 95.7 FM. Today, we're asking you to give what you can and every dollar counts. Your gift to the community is an investment in honest-to-goodness independent radio, a commodity that's become pretty rare these days. Visit radiolex.us slash donate and support Lexington's community radio right now. Hey Lexington, if you're at least 16, you can get the COVID-19 vaccine. I did it for my neighbor. I did it for my family. I did it for Sundays. I did it for Tuesdays. I did it for race days. I did it for my students. I did it to see my friends. I did it for my team. Let's do this. Learn more at lexingtonky.gov slash vaccines. Uh, that was thing. I know. Don't it sound I know. Like I was like, wow, I didn't really expect does. that to happen. Let's get discrimination claims when there is no fee for our service. If you have a discrimination complaint, you can follow it online at lexhumanrights.org or call us at 252 All right. I'm going to make this last. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to Off the Cuff. Adam Banks here with you. Amber is also in studio with me. Last segment of the hour. If you didn't notice, before we went to commercial break, I got a hard cut on me there with the commercials. The commercial just started playing out of the blue. I guess that was the producer saying you need to take a break. Probably telling you to hush. That's I think that's the 2021 version of saying hush. <laughs> hard cut on commercial break. <laughs> It's like, why did it have to happen on wrestling, though? I feel like every time we talk about wrestling, something happens. An, an alarm goes off or something is distracting. The roof's falling in. The roof starts leaking. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's the producers just don't like us talking about wrestling. Maybe it's because we got so much love for wrestling. It just shakes the whole world. And things start coming unglued. It shakes the foundation. Do you like this song? You know. Makes you want to dance, don't it? I'm trying to envision what it's like to be out in a club dancing. It's been so long since I've done that. I don't even think I remember what it's like to go dance Things anymore. are slowly, my dear, getting back to normal. Yeah, but are we too, like, am I too old now? I'm afraid if I try to drop it now, I'll have to come back <laughs> up with a swivel hip or something. I mean, you can't keep that same lifestyle you had in your 20s and party hard all the time like you did because you used to get down. I used to put razor blades in my shoes, baby. What's that I, mean? I was cutting a rug all over his town. Interesting. <laughs> well, if you don't like this music, Amber, maybe you will appreciate this music. Because Amazon will no longer test for marijuana at their facilities. The e-commerce giant, which is the second largest private employer in the United States behind Walmart, is making the change as several states legalize cannabis. Amazon said it will continue to test workers for other drugs and conduct impairment checks on the job. And it said some roles may still require a marijuana test in line with the Department of Transportation regulations. The category that that includes, it's things like delivery truck drivers and people who operate heavy machinery. I think that this is a great move for Amazon to be one of the first major companies to take marijuana off of their drug screening panel because... Let me say, let me just say this. I think that there are so much worse out there than marijuana. Absolutely. I think that alcohol 
and I've been so vocal on this. Mm-hmm. Alcohol is the worst drug in the world. It's I the, 100% agree. It's the worst drug that we have on this planet, and look how accessible it is. And freely. We pass it out to people. Freely. Freely. And anybody who drinks a lot, they know how they feel afterwards. They know what it can do to them. You've heard horror stories of people who have done terrible things while under the influence of alcohol. Just story after story after story will confirm that alcohol is just a terrible drug. And it's so accessible. But... People look down at those. People who are heavy drinkers will look down at those who like to smoke a little weed. Mm-hmm. Can you explain to me why? And is it because it's illegal? Do you? Th- I think that's truly what it is. I think it's because society says you can't have it, so you're such a bad person for doing it. That has to be what it is, right? That's the only thing I can come up with. In all sincerity, that's really all I can come up with is, do people place this stigma upon marijuana because we have been told our whole lives that it was bad? Yeah. Because if you think back on our childhood, what was the one drug we used to see commercials about? It was marijuana. We never saw anybody like snorting a line of, you know, snorting a line of something, uh, illicit drug, you know, on the television screen to show us the side effects of these harder drugs, we were always shown, hey, if you smoke marijuana, you're going to be like this girl who's deflated in the couch and can't move. Well, she got a little hold of a little indica. Let her take a nap. She'll be all right. Right. I remember those. (laughs) I I remember those commercials. So-and-so used to be fun until she started smoking weed. Well, she needs a nap and maybe a Kit Kat bar, man. Leave her alone. And I'm not saying it's okay to just go out and, just like with drinking, it's not okay to sit down and drink all day. It's not okay to sit around and just smoke weed all day. Use it if you need it as, if that's your, if that's prescribed to you Mm -hmm. and, and you're using it to help you, I see no problems and I see no issues with that. There, it helps. There's so many medical benefits to marijuana that's been proven: sleep, stress, anxiety, cramps, aches, pains. There's so much that it helps, but people won't do it because it's illegal. So they'll go seek out things that are legal, mm-hmm. and that's things like opioids. And we already know what that does to the body. How people get addicted to that? Yes. And then we expect people to stop cold turkey because we only gave them 12, but yet we're giving you something that is so addictive that uh, once you're done with these 12, you will now, you know, do whatever means necessary to get another 12 and then get another 12. So, I mean, if that's the society that people want to live in, you know, there's no wonder why we're continuously going downhill. We need to find Uh, better ways to deal with mental health and we see consistently that marijuana has been shown to improve not only people with severe depression, people with severe anxiety, people with phobias uh, such as agoraphobia which I have. Um, So you know if that's the world we want to continue to live in then so be it. Yeah and like I said at the beginning of this I think that it's great that Amazon is doing this. They're one of the first major companies to take marijuana off their drug screening panel uh, I think it's uh, it's a push in the right direction. I think somebody like Amazon needed to be the first to do it. I don't know if they're necessarily the first to do it, but they're one of the mainstream major companies to do it. Yeah, they're one of the uh, the, the the brand names the, to do yeah, it. One of the blue collar jobs to go out yes. and, and and say we're not going to test you for marijuana because. There are so many people that will not smoke and do other drugs Mm -hmm. to help the pain that they need or or the situation that they need uh, because they know that they can't fail a drug test at work. And Amazon is saying, you know what, Uh, if, if they know, they're using their brain, they're using common sense, they know that, uh, mar- that coke cocaine will be out of your system in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. They know that opioids will be out of your system in 72 hours. They know that. So there's like, we would rather you smoke a little weed Mm -hmm. than do all this other stuff. They're treating it like like alcohol. A spokesman for Amazon said, we will no longer include marijuana in our comprehensive drug screening program for any positions not regulated by the Department of Transportation Mm -hmm. and will instead treat it the same as alcohol use. And it will still test for all drugs and alcohol after any indications or other incidents. So you can't just smoke weed and go to work. No. If you look under the influence, they will drug test you. Absolutely. As they should. As they should. Because you cannot 
go to work under the influence. No, this is to be done in the confinements of your home. I've been seeing hilarious memes since Amazon said that they are legalizing marijuana about packages being laid and <laughs> what we could find in our packages. And I started thinking about that. Really, you know, we like to joke around about people uh, going to work under the influence of weed. I'd say that now that they can smoke weed, knowing that they're not going to get drug tested, think about how many employees at Amazon is going to go to work stoned. And yeah, but I can tell you so many people I've encountered drunk on the job, and and they're working and they're working with our boxes and deliveries. Think about how and what kind of stuff could be in there. I trust them more than I would someone who's drinking who's, on the job. Who's drinking? You yeah, know. at least maybe then I might get a few free things. Like be like one of my every plate boxes. They give me a little card, free gift. Man, people really do drink on the job. I know. I have physically witnessed someone. I have had to, as a member of management. Uh, send someone home before for drinking on the job. That was one of those things. I was like, wow. Yeah, I mean, you got to think, when I used to work a nine to five, I would go out on lunch break and I would see people just slamming drinks back mm -hmm. at the bar and they had their work attire on. I was, and they would go back to work drunk. So, yeah, I mean, just imagine how productive that had to be. Uh, well, we see how productive that is. That's why we've got hostile working environments. We've got disgruntled employees, and that's why everybody generally is just kind of mad when they have to go to work. Yeah, so they are going to treat it like alcohol. I think that that is a pretty big push in the right direction. I still don't think Kentucky is going to legalize it anytime soon. Boo. And, and let me also just uh, end the segment with this. A lot of times people think just because you speak positive about marijuana that you smoke it. No. I, I, it's like, I'm now everybody's going to say, well, Adam's a big stoner. Adam smokes weed. Just because I think that weed helps things that, just because I think it's a good supplement versus opioids and alcohol doesn't mean that I smoke it. And so what? So what if you do? Ain't nobody's business. Ain't, ain't none of your business. And, and that's the thing. And it's just... It's Unless just, you're offering. And it's just funny that people actually like to say stuff like that. But I think it's a push in the right direction. And I think nothing but good things will come from that. It will be interesting to see how things go, though. It will be interesting to see how things go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that about wraps it up for this week's episode of Off the Cuff. You can follow the show on social media at... Off the Cuff with Adam Banks on Facebook and Instagram. You can follow the co-host, Amber Turner, at Ambu447. You can follow me, the host, Adam Banks, at The Adam Banks on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can listen to all of our previous episodes on podcasting platforms, wherever podcasts can be listened to, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, we release new episodes live every Thursday from 4 to 5 right here on WLXU 93.9. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Amber Turner. I'm Adam Banks, and this is Off the Cuff. We'll see you next Thursday. We'll catch you down the road. See you guys.